Yeah, all right. Well, good morning. My name is Ron Daniels. Uh, welcome to the last day of Dragon Con. Uh, I'm a consumer protection attorney down in middle Georgia. Uh, I do a few other things, but a lot of my practice is on dealing with uh, debt collection, credit reporting errors, and other sort of consumer protection matters related to privacy. Uh, and this uh, panel is entitled, I'm going to give you the official title, and then I'm going to tell you just basically short form what it means. But uh, our technical title is, if I know how to work my phone, Medical Offices Requiring a Credit Card on File. Um, really what we're talking about is uh, doctors and other providers uh, wanting to know whether or not you can pay your bill before you get treated. Uh, that's sort of the simplistic version of, of the topic. Um, I just kind of tell you all how I vision this going. We've, we've got a, a smaller crowd this morning, uh, but I know we're all thankful you're all here. If any point in time you have a question, there's a microphone, just come on down, uh, ask a question. I don't mind being interrupted. Uh, there's not so many of us here that we all can't ask multiple questions. Uh, I will give you the disclaimer. I am a lawyer. I do practice here. Uh, Y'all are not my clients. Anything I say is not legal advice because there's not an attorney-client relationship and I have to provide you this disclaimer or my insurance company gets mad at me. Um, and I apologize for that. But um, So I, I'm just going to start with w what I think is probably the the – the background of why this is becoming more commonplace. There was a study put out in, I believe, 2016 by some industry folks in the medical billing side of things that indicated that most patients pay their bills uh, to their doctor's offices or certain providers uh, that might not be necessarily doctors, but like LabCorp or, uh, you know, like a, a CPAP supply company or, you know, what have you, uh, within the first month, about 70% pay that bill. Um, what happens, though, is the 30% that don't uh, tend to require a lot of prompting, and uh, that caused the industry to say, well, we're not just sending one payment reminder, we're sending six or seven payment reminders, and there's a lot of time and administrative work that goes into trying to capture that 30 percent and so why don't we start keeping credit cards on file or coming up with things that you may have seen like the uh, if you go to the dentist did they have a credit card you can get to put your services on a credit card that they assist you in applying for uh, i think that's I don't remember the name of those cards, but you've probably seen them at various providers. And it, Care Credit, that's it. I knew it was Care something. I wanted to say Care Connect, but that's the name of a, uh, a, uh, a like an urgent care where I live. Um, and so the whole setup here is trying to, for medical providers to find a way to not pay as much administratively uh, while being able to recoup the costs of, of the services they provide. Um, there's a lot of problems, and, and just sort of to kind of give you the, the big picture, um, we're not talking about any sort of type of emergent care. Uh, there's federal law, MTALA, that prevents uh, this sort of thing in an emergent care situation, uh, though you will be surprised sometimes when you go to an emergency room or any sort of provider that's affiliated with a hospital, of all the paperwork that you get that nobody really reads all of uh, you just sort of start filling it out sometimes uh, what they do with that information and some are now asking for credit card information even regardless of whether that's going to be an issue because you you may or may not want to do it they still have to treat you in an emergent care situation so we're really talking about more of outpatient you know your everyday doctor visits uh, a case I have now involves someone who was having a colonoscopy done, and that was, you know, obviously an outpatient procedure. He was no longer going to be in the hospital. It was completely done at a surgical site. Um, a lot of these are dentists. Um, 
from from what I have seen, at least in my practice, uh, and a lot of them are uh, situations where your bill is not going to be your typical copay. Um, I don't think most doctors are too terribly concerned about a $25 to $60 copay and the administrative hassle running that down and wanting a credit card on file about that. Um, nobody seems to get too worked up over that. What they get worked up over is when you go and your your doctor's visit is your insurance pays $400 and they say there's $300 left over. Uh, and then they have to run that money down. Uh, at least that's what the studies that the medical industry have show. Uh, and all these, I, I don't think there's any more recent post-COVID. Uh, most of them are from the 2016 to 2018 time range, so the numbers probably have changed. Uh, no surprise there. Um, the percentages probably have changed. The, the, the amounts of money have probably changed, but uh, you know, they they don't do these studies that frequently and, and release them. Um, that that's sort of the trick to it is. Uh, I'm not sure how the study that that I was able to find and sort of cull through several years ago when I started getting some cases involving this um, originated. But it, I don't know that it was intended to be released for public consumption, but it was. So yay public. Um, one of the major issues that I have found and I see is uh, a lot of doctor's offices don't understand what it means when they get your credit card information. Um, number one, it's technically protected by HIPAA. Um, if you read HIPAA, uh, it's personal identifiable information under HIPAA and even though it has nothing to do with your your diagnoses, your health, uh, it's just your personal information. The second they put it in their file, it becomes HIPAA protected information. And so they have to be HIPAA compliant with it. Uh, they can't, for instance, say, well, we're going to keep this administrative stuff in a separate file somewhere and not have the same security measures we have with everything else. No, that, that doesn't work. Um, What's interesting is a lot of times doctor's offices are outsourcing billing uh, and you get all these questions about whether they are HIPAA compliant. Uh, you even, even if they're not getting your credit card information, whether they're HIPAA compliant in their billing procedures just because they're bringing in a third party. Uh, what sort of vetting they've done, what sort of a collateral agreement they have with those individuals to do that third party billing and when you start introducing information such as credit card authorizations, you start running into problems. In particular, one case I have handled that is somewhat still ongoing, and the individual had treatment at a facility, uh, his card information was on file. Um, but he had the procedure done in 2017. Uh, he had put a card on file in 2014, he had updated that card information in 2015 and a third party provider got the information and sent, tried to charge his card um, in 2017. Does anybody want to guess where they made a boo-boo at? Third party did the billing, but they messed up because they billed the card that expired in 2015. And if they just turned the page and the file, they would have seen the updated card information. But, you know, they also tried to charge him like a 5% surcharge uh, for <laughs> credit card being rejected and all these things. It's like, well, you just had to flip the page. But number one, why did you have this to begin with? Let's talk about that. Uh, but number two, uh, could you at least have bothered to charge the right card? I mean, come on. Um, so... You get into a host of you know, what information can actually be shared between parties uh, situations and uh, typically what you will find with third party billing companies is they can't give you a real itemized bill. Uh, they can give you a condensed bill but it doesn't have any of the information about the treatment you received and things like that because of HIPAA protections. 
most of their agreements do not include the protections for your credit card information on file that would be required by HIPAA the same way, you know, if I go to my doctor and my doctor's doing blood work because I have Hachimoto's thyroiditis, um, you know, the billing company doesn't necessarily see that. They see the blood work was done. There's a code there for the blood work, uh, but they can't really tell anybody, even if I send them a HIPAA authorization saying, hey, give me my information, they can't really explain to me what's going on. They just show blood work code H02.789. Um, and they've got an agreement with the provider that says, hey, you know, this is the information that can be shared. And this is how we will use the information and this is how we will protect that information. They haven't, for the most part, gone through and said, okay, well, here's also the consumer's credit card information. It's protected and here's how you have to protect it. And so when you get to those third parties is really where you get the problem with sort of the privacy aspect of your information getting in other people's hands. Um, the other big issue and the big red flag with the whole idea of keeping some sort of credit on file with a medical provider is, well, who decides when a charge is appropriate? Um, which is probably what most people get more riled up about than anything else. Um, every year, almost like clockwork, you see some sort of local news article about surprise medical bills or they're doing some sort of feature story about oh, you know, what's lurking in your EOBs and things of that nature. Uh, and if anybody here thinks that our healthcare industry is a well-run uh, industry and just is infallible, please raise your hand. Okay. And look, my wife is a nurse, so uh, I see all sides of the healthcare industry, but... Um, the, the economics of healthcare in this country is just sort of one of those mind-boggling things that you scratch your head about. Um, and as a lawyer in particular that does a whole lot of different things, uh, I see all sorts of things that just make you scratch your head. Like I know people have very good insurance. They're federal employees or they have TRICARE uh, and they get in a car wreck and they go to the doctor and the doctor doesn't want to bill their insurance because they can get more money from car insurance because there was a wreck and then you have to explain to the doctor well they were at fault so there's not going to be any insurance from a car wreck they ran over someone that's sort of why you should be billing their health insurance and you find out well they waited 90 days to bill their health insurance and so their health insurance won't pay anymore and then all of a sudden they say, well, you owe the $600 worth of, uh, you know, $600 worth of what would have been co-pays, you know, 40 or $50 a visit. You owe these all these charges that we would have billed to your insurance, but we didn't bill timely because uh, we were trying to get more money. Um, and then you have to argue with your doctor's office, and that's just never fun in uh, it, it's a headache, and usually folks are just sitting there saying, well, you know, what do you mean? And then if your card is on file, they don't argue with you. They just bill it. And you wake up, and you get a little notification on your phone if, if you do all that, or you look at your next statement if you're still doing it that way, and you say, what do you mean I've got a $600 bill with Dr. Smith? I haven't gone to Dr. Smith and swiped my credit card. And little did you realize that it's in some paperwork you filled out on day one when you went and signed up with Dr. Smith's office that you were consenting to them to have your credit card on file and to bill it. Um, usually they sneak in nice little things about text messages in there too, which is always fun, uh, and emails and all those things. And look, I mean, I, I, I'll tell you myself, I can go to an endocrinologist, whatever reason they couldn't figure out how to send me a bill for about eight months um and i was very happy to pay them my copay I, no issue paying my endocrinologist uh, my copay the problem was they claimed they were mailing me uh notices every month but uh, they didn't have my physical address correct um it's just entirely wrong zip code and entirely wrong street address 
probably because I have terrible handwriting. Um, but they had sent me emails about my appointment reminders and called me about my appointment reminders and sent me texts about my appointment reminders. And I had filled out surveys uh, that they sent me every time I went on my phone. I just clicked and go give a survey and say, this is what happened. And I, and I had a good visit and it was timely. and I didn't have to wait very long and I appreciate that. And never once did I get a bill via email until eight months down the road. And they're like, you know you have a outstanding balance of 400 and some odd dollars? I'm like, no, I did not. Where have you been sending the bill? They go, 700 Falk Road, 31047? Like, that's not a zip code, number one. Uh, that should have been your first red flag, and that's not my address. Uh, and so, you know, I we got it straightened out, but... Um, even if they had a card on file, imagine what would happen in that situation where they're trying to bill, you know, charge my card with Capital One and they punch in the zip code that doesn't match my billing zip code. Um, it ain't going to go anywhere. Um, it, and it may trigger a fraud alert and they may lock down your card. So, you know, there, there's all sorts of fun things that can happen there. Um, but there's also this layer of, we're talking about like the, the, care credit and things like that of where does it get beyond a line of simply a, a treatment provider or a physician or a dentist you just requiring you to have some sort of form of payment on card and where they're actually intermingling and assisting you and applying for some form of credit through a third party uh, such that you can get treatment and then you're putting your treatment you know essentially on, on a credit card. I mean, that's what it is. And you can't use it like you would a normal credit card. You can't say, I'm going to you know, go buy my Dragon Con tickets uh, on it. it you, you can only use it at certain providers, but it's, it's essentially a credit card. You're putting it on credit. Your, your credit's been extended to you. You're make, making a loan, essentially. Um, you. What happens when you're also dealing with them? Because, you know, care card folks know that you're getting some sort of treatment um, there's privacy implications there of you know what sort of level do they need to know about your information that you are going to have this treatment whether it's a root canal whether it's a you know you you've got a you got a mold that needs to come off uh, whether it's something like a you know you, you need a rotor rooter of your sinus cavity you got a deviated septum that needs to be surgically fixed yeah. how much information do they need to know um, and that's always a big question to me is how much information do they need to know and how much information are they actually getting um, because you fill out the application well they've got to know approximately what the procedure is going to cost and so they've got to have some sort of information about oh I'm the physician I say this person needs a root canal or this person needs a crown or this person needs uh, nine cavities drilled and filled um, they, they've got to have some sort of rubric you don't just go and apply for a credit card and they say oh yeah we're going to give you a fifteen thousand dollar credit limit uh, no they they want to know what your income is what you know what your other debts are uh, how long you've lived at your house you know where you work do you have a spouse? Do you owe child support? Do you get alimony? All those sorts of things. And the care card is asking the same things, but they're also trying to figure out what your purchase is for. And they need somebody to say your purchase is necessary because uh, it's like going to buy a car. Uh, you are buying a very specific thing. You are not just getting an extension of credit of money that you can go spend on. So uh, I always get nervous when I see somebody has had a care card just because I don't know what sort of information has been exchanged with a third party uh, that I may or may not have issue with. Um, I've never used one. I probably never will. Uh, I'm going to hope this is wood. Uh, I hope I don't ever need to use one. Um, but that's largely because I get really nervous when I start talking about, you know, my information being exchanged by people and I don't care you know if I say it myself I don't mind telling you everything's wrong with me medically uh, it'd be really boring 
uh, you would all probably leave and nobody would find it exciting. And it's one thing if I tell you myself directly. It's another thing if I go tell John Smith down the hall, oh, I got this, this, and this wrong, and I expect you to have that in you know, confidence. And then John Smith says, well, you know, Ron, he's got this problem, and so I'm going to buy him a sandwich. Um, you know, I don't necessarily want John Smith telling other people what's wrong with me or what I've got going on. It doesn't matter if I was healthy as a horse or if, you know, I, I had six weeks to live. I, I just don't want somebody else telling other people what's going on with me. Uh, and I think most people are like that. We don't want people just unnecessarily having access to our information about what it is going on with us, uh, whether whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. Um, the when when you get down to sort of the nitty gritty of of how it works, that's where uh, I, I think a lot of people may or may not have more of an initial like gut reaction to, oh, I don't want you to have a credit card or some sort of way to build me on file is because um, you don't usually get a bill in the the mail before you've been charged. Um, I've never, never had a card on file with somebody that got billed without me knowing it. I've always been there, signed the receipt, paid my copay, then I would get a bill in the mail. My doctor, look, I, I'm, I'm in rural middle Georgia. My doctor doesn't know how to keep a credit card on file. Uh, and if he wanted to, he'd call me and ask me how to do it. And I would tell him no. And he would listen to me because he's a client. Um, but, you know, what happens is usually they charge your card before you know you owe something. Um, that's the whole point of putting it on file with someone is it's there so when they think they need it, they can charge it. Um, and you may not have your EOB back from your insurance company. Uh, you, you may not have, if it's a situation where you don't have an insurance company, but you have one of the, like the medical sharing plans, you may not have something back saying, you know, this is how much is approved and this is how much not approved. Um, you may just be completely out there lost and saying, I don't know why I got an $80 charge on my credit card from the doctor's office. Uh, and I think that's really where a lot of people say, you know, one, we don't want you to have a card on file to begin with. That that seems to be an issue just very logically. But two, we we don't want to just be surprised with a charge one day and not have a heads up, hey, you're about to charge me for X. Um, and, and I say that most people have a logical problem with it because... I don't know of too many other things that you go and, and need as goods or services in your life. I know I don't, that I don't know what it's going to cost me the second I get to the cash register or I get to the checkout window, you know, when I go get my oil changed in my Honda. Um, I know what it costs the second I'm about to leave. Um, when I go to Walmart to buy groceries or I go to the butcher shop to buy groceries, I know what it is when I get to the checkout. You know, if there's something there that I don't want, I can say, take it back. Um, I can't think of a single time I've been to a doctor's office uh, where they said, this is what we think it's going to cost. Do you want us to continue with your care? Um, that's not a conversation we typically have. And so uh, I think most people just have an issue with saying, here's a blank check. Um, we got a question. Well, it's, it's a comment. Okay. A few years back, I was uninsured and I had an inguinal hernia. I walked into the local medical center and said, how much? And they said, I don't know, around $14,000. And I went, okay, and walked out. <laughs> I did a little online research, searched around, eventually found a surgeon in Oklahoma who runs a practice called No Insurance Surgery. All of his prices are up front and on his webpage. So you know what you're paying for. But that's so rare. It is extremely rare. Um, and, and one of the big problems is, uh, it, you know, his, he's marked himself as no insurance, 
Um, that's one of the big problems is insurance because what the sticker price is and what insurance pays are two very different things. Um, and when I say very different, I mean the sticker price may be $14,000 and you see your EOB and insurance may have paid $3,000. Um, and that's really driven a lot by Medicare Medicaid uh, and their reimbursement rates. They set what they will pay hospitals and providers uh, for certain things and it's usually about 30 percent of whatever the build amount is what they say can be the maximum build amount so it's not just you know oh i want to charge twenty thousand dollars for a bag of normal saline um, they say normal saline is valued at ninety dollars a bag so we'll pay you thirty dollars a bag it is salt water y'all uh, in a little plastic bag um, just a pro tip, if you ever need to hydrate, just get some salt, some water, and a Ziploc bag. You're pretty good. Um, you know, that's not real medical advice. Please don't listen to me about real medical advice. Um, but, you know, that that's what drives that is insurance rates and what they pay. And, you know, even with private insurance, it's the same thing. We have another question. Not, not really a question, just a, um, I'm a physician, by the way, so... Just let, you you get to deal with yeah. the the yeah. the evil insurance companies. Yeah. So well, let, to put it in perspective, though, you know, Medicare and Medicaid rates are much lower, but they pay, Medicaid pays me in one week. Mm -hmm. Medicaid Medicare pays me in two weeks. I don't have this problem with Medicaid and Medicare patients. Right. Private insurance companies they will with the same I, same ICD ten code and a CPT code for the same procedure. Medicare I get paid in two weeks. Blue Cross Blue Shield, they'll drag it out to day 89 mm -hmm. before they even pay. So, yes, the insurance is the problem. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather, honestly, most doctors who said they weren't going to take Medicare or Medicaid, if I didn't take Medicare or Medicaid, I couldn't keep the lights on. Yeah. I, I have that revenue cycle every week to two weeks. So just to... But, yeah. now, do you find that it, the, the numbers, like the 70% number, is that still pretty accurate about how many people pay within a month? Uh, yes. Okay. So uh, that... Yeah, so one of the reasons I have to tell people that I know co pays actually is for us primary care doctors. Uh, we have three practitioners, doctors, and two nurse practitioners or a mail out just to collect co pays is seventy to a week. Yeah. So if I get in my credit card charges, we don't just have five hours we have one co pay. Yeah. Yeah, which means you can see your patients faster, yes. and they don't wait in the lobby for two hours. Um, that's a story with my doctor that I won't get into. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a, it, it's. I don't think it's a secret. I don't. I don't know anybody that outside of the insurance industry that really loves the insurance companies. Um, you know, they they drive a lot of of everything. It's. Um, and and you know it's it's unfortunate but it's the reality that we all have to deal with that that's that's the case that we are all beholden to insurance companies driving the medical industry um and i, I think what you did and going and finding somebody that if, if you didn't have insurance and you wanted to find somebody that was going to be cheaper than it's doing it that way that's absolutely the thing you can do um, that's not realistic for most medical providers, though, um, just because. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, you know, when I had my wisdom teeth extracted, I, I recall very vividly telling uh, the, the surgeon, uh, Dr. Carey, uh, that in my line of work, I really didn't get too concerned until he said, oh, crap. Uh, 
and I don't really remember anything else because he, I think he, he goosed me up pretty well with some verse said uh, when I said that because uh, I think it made him nervous because he didn't think it was a joke. Um, but, you know, I mean, yeah, that, that is the problem with going somewhere like Mexico or Thailand or Malaysia and having a surgery is, you know, what happens if you have a complication. Um, and it, it's, you know, let, let's assume the worst uh, just because I'm a lawyer and that's what we do. Um, you know, let's assume that you, you don't wake up. Um, you, you've created not only like a surgical complication, but you've created a whole host of legal issues when you die in another country. Um, and, and it's not a fun ball of yarn to unwind. Uh, I promise you I've had to do it. Uh, it, it is not fun for, for anybody that has to pick up the pieces. But uh, you re- yeah, arguably, I don't know that you should have to go to another country to get a surgery that you need. Um, and you know, it sounds like you found a great way to do it by going to you know, just Oklahoma, which some people regard as another country, but I don't. Um, it's un, it's Monday morning. Y'all can laugh. It's, it's you know, it's, it's okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I don't know. There's too much more that I can say on this without just starting filling questions. If y'all have any questions, feel free to start shooting them out. Okay. I had to have emergency surgery on my eye. Before they would do the emergency surgery, I had to come up with about $4,000. Almost half, about a third to half of which was for the anesthesiologist. A couple of days ago, I got a call saying the anesthesiologist has been paid. So the the question is, uh, somebody got a bill from anesthesiologist. They paid up front for the anesthesiologist service is a requirement for the surgery to to even be contemplated in doing, and, and it happened. Uh, and now they've gotten a bill. And, and what should you do? The the first thing you need to do is figure out who is sending you a bill, um, because. Uh, if it's from a collection company, uh, you've got the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act that sort of protects you, and you can demand they do certain things. Um, if it's just a, if it's coming from a billing company or you know, uh, just some resource that the anesthesiologist is using to send out bills, or his office, or her office, uh, or their office, you know, absolutely ask for an itemized bill you're going to get more pushback from a debt collector because they don't have access to the itemized bill. Uh, they have they, they have a different ledger that they get sent because what happens is they get sent batches of collection files and they're far more limited in what, what they get. Again, there you go with HIPAA. Um, but the, that that's where you need to start is, is ask those questions and, uh, you know, it, I will tell you that a lot of times what happens is there's a charge for the anesthesiologist, uh, but there's also charges for the anesthesiologist through the hospital or who, wherever the surgery site is, if it's, a, if it's one of these outpatient surgical centers, um, and, and they're two different things. Um, and that's one of my problems, and I fussed at my wife and her employer about it multiple times, uh, is, you know, I, I've had surgeries in the last two years. I had a surgery at the start of, I guess it was 2020. No, it was 20. Yeah, I had a surgery at the start of 2020. It's been so long. Maybe it was 2021. It was 2021. Um, it was after COVID. It's been a long two years, y'all. Um, I know everybody knows that. Uh, I, I broke my foot and I've, I had anesthesia done. I had an ortho that is affiliated with the hospital. 
uh, you know, and I, I see my bills and uh, most of it are get wiped out because I'm on a very special insurance plan that when you get treated at the hospital that provides your insurance and is self-insured, they tend to not send too many bills, which is nice. Um, but, you know, I got a bill for anesthesiology because it was third party and I got a bill for x-rays both during the surgery and after the surgery because it's a third party provider that actually reads the x-rays. Um, but I also see where they bill the insurance you know, for doing the x-ray. <laughs> so it's, you know, you've got the ER physicians who are typically a third party company. Sometimes now your hospitalist is a third party company that may send you a bill as well on top of the hospital. Um, there are just so many layers to it. Uh, and part of the reason for that is because there's lawyers that like to sue uh, people for doing things wrong. Um, but there's also insurance considerations. You know, how much can you get out of insurance companies? Where can you cut red tape? Where can you cut the fat and trim it down and streamline your practices? And where can you maximize things? And then when you start talking about rural medicine in, in particular, um, you, you know, it, it's hard to find three hospitalists to will share a shift to come to Eastman, Georgia. Um, you know, when when we had COVID going, we had an OBGYN acting as an intensive care doctor because that's all we had. Um, you know, it, it it's 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 difficult sometimes to get, and it, it's not just doctors that it's hard to get to rural areas. We have a grand total of five lawyers in my town, um, and I being the youngest. And uh, but when I say youngest, I mean they've all got twenty years on me, so. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, you need, you definitely need to ask where, where that money went. Cause, uh, and I've seen something similar to that happen, but it was with, uh, and apparently our doctor back here may have some more information on this, but apparently there are surgical assistants that are basically, they have privileges at certain hospitals, but they're not necessarily assigned to a doctor or to a practice or anything like that. They're, they're just surgical assistants and they're third parties. And we had somebody who once got a, like, it really looks like she paid. Um, and she had insurance and she actually got a check back to pay the surgical assistant. And he started changing his bill once he found out how much money she got paid and wanted more money um, because he found out how much the check she got was. Um, and, and that just got to be somewhat of a nightmare scenario. And so I, you, you need to ask where that money went because in that situation, she had paid up front, her insurance had paid and her insurance gave her a check to pay. And then they started changing the numbers after every, you know, this is a good 70, 80 days after every, everything was said and done, everything's been billed. You had a question, doc. So the question is whether or not the, the legislation that's been talked about and debated and sort of pushed in, in various states and I think at the federal level will help with surprise billing. Uh, if it passes, um, I think so. Um, I don't think surprise medical bills are, uh, are a surprise. Um, we've, we've all sort of known about this now for at least 20 years. Um, th these issues have been popping up. Um, I think I think people are getting more fed up. I think social media helps with that, that people can talk about things more. And it's a whole lot easier to leave a Google review now uh, and to you know, file a complaint with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau than it used to be. Uh, so I think there's more discourse about these issues now. Um, 
But I think there's certainly, like, I usually am not in favor of more laws. Um, I, I really think you, know, you could probably reduce most of the laws that we need into a book. Um, and then we keep adding to them. And sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes it's a bad thing. Sometimes it's, we're, we're, we're creating problems in search of a solution um, for problems that didn't exist. Um, and so, but that's what I think actually would be something. And, and, you know, you get in the issues of balance billing and things like that, too. Um, in, in one case I'm working on now, I've got 80 people uh, throughout middle Georgia that went to a urgent care provider uh, that did not get bills for six years. Their insurance companies did not get billed. They paid their copay when they went to the urgent care. Uh, some of them had cards on file. Some of them did not, um, just because they, they were using it as their primary care physician, too. Uh, and some of them were just popping in because they had a sinus infection. They needed a Z-pack and some, you know, a steroid shot and some antibiotics or something like that. Um, but I've got 80 people that uh, didn't get bills for between four and six years that all of a sudden started getting bills five months after the pandemic started. Uh, and it's for small amounts of money, sometimes $20, $40, and sometimes it's for $1,200, and sometimes it's for $2,000. And you can clearly see on there the treatment dates. Are, I've got some that are as far back as 2012, and you can see where they tried to bill Blue Cross and Blue Shield in 2020 for services rendered in 2012. And it just makes you sit there and scratch your head and like, what is going on here? Um so you know the and what what you inevitably see though even on the ones that could have been potentially timely is there's the balance left here's what insurance paid or proved and oh you owe the rest because we didn't submit it timely or or there's a bunch left over i i think those are big issues that probably need to be put in any sort of legislation about surprise billing is the balance billing um, you know, you can't just say, you know, in your practice, you can't just say, well, insurance paid $250 on this care that costs $500 and your copay is $60, so I'm going to send you a bill for the rest. Um, you don't do that. and You can't do that. But there are people that do. They just do it in a different way like that. But I, I hope we get some sort of legislation that you know, says, hey, you've got to timely submit these claims to insurance companies, but you also got to timely submit them to consumers. Um, That's why, uh, I have in-house safest way to go. We have a question back there. Yeah. Everyone, I would say from our perspective, everyone's in favor of some legislation to fix this. Um, the fight that's going on now is what database you use yeah. to do it. So the insurance companies have their database. Um, there is an open source database that is most physicians want to use because it's, it's open. You know what the user's customary numbers are, what that would look like. And the insurance ones are proprietary. They can't see into the database. I will tell you that nobody wants to be in that business of sending people bills after their insurance company has decided, hey, they're not going to pay the bill or they're going to pay substantially less than whatever the contract or bill is that you have. Uh, and you know, I'm sure you're well aware, a lot of this is network based on. So if it's in, in network versus out of network, that changes things. Yeah. Um, it, and, you know, I, I can appreciate. You, uh, can you repeat that? Yeah, that, that, I was going to try to summarize what you said. Uh, uh, with the balance billing in, in the legislation to, to try and prohibit that, part of the problem is there's two different, there's not two different, there's multiple databases in which the bills could be coming, um, you, where, where you're comparing charges, what's appropriate charges, what, whether your charge masters are correct, things of that nature. Um, but ultimately what, what I think the point was is that the doctors themselves, and I think both of our doctors that I know about in this room, 
uh, are on the same page with this, but uh, y'all don't want to be in the position of sending the bills. Y'all care about treating your patients and getting them well. Um, you know, it's sort of a necessary evil that y'all have to make money and survive too, um, but you don't necessarily want to have to be the, the bad guy saying, oh, your insurance didn't pay this, you now owe $900. Um, so, and I appreciate that. I appreciate what both of y'all do. Um, and I, I appreciate what all our healthcare workers do because I, mean, I, I live with one and uh, I'm scared to not appreciate what she does because I might not wake up, to be honest with you. Uh, I'm a smart man. I really am. I, I didn't just make it to law school on a fluke. Um, any more questions? Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. So I'm a clinical social worker in a, a hospital-based cancer institute. And, I, you know, I get the billing questions all the time. Um, and I didn't know what you were saying about the, the collection agencies don't get the, the specific information, but all the collection bills that my patients are showing me say, if you want, to, if you want an itemized bill and or to dispute this bill, check this box and mail it back to us. So they check the box, nothing happens, they just get more bills. So is that something for the Attorney General's Office of the State or um, because they're not getting the information they need, they just get more bills and they never, you know, they, they can't ever find out what they're disputing. So that, that, that probably does need to be something addressed at a state level with each state. Um, and if they're an actual debt collector, I mean, there, there's certain requirements that they have to oblige by under the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Um, and, and I will tell you, there are very few that do it right. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you about four or five in the state of Georgia who actually have the correct agreements in place to get the records from the, whether it's primary care, whether it's a social worker, you know, whatever the treatment provider is. I know of four that actually do it right. Um, two of them didn't used to do it right, uh, but they're mean lawyers out there like me. Uh, and they they changed a lot of things because of me. It was kind of fun. It's it's real fun in my in my world to see all of a sudden a a letter that used to say there will be a two dollar or two point five percent surcharge added to if you pay by credit card this debt you know this medical bill uh, to this debt collector, and all of a sudden I sue them and I get a letter in for a new client two months later and they've removed that. It, that's fun to see that I've disrupted the system. Um, but yeah, it, there are very few that do it right. Uh, and it's because it's complicated. Mm -hmm. and, and from the perspective of the practices, and, and I mean, even you know, your job, I'm sure they don't necessarily want to have the, the, the liability of sharing that information because it falls back on the providers. Um, you know, it, it's not just who gets the information that gets in trouble. If they screw up and release it, it, it follows up the chain. Uh, and while there's no private right of action or HIPAA, I mean, you don't want the feds, you know, pushing around a HIPAA violation. That's, I, yep. Yeah, well, I feel like our, our hospital system in general that I work for it screws up billing constantly anyway. And so they're, but I've noticed since the pandemic, they're real quick to send it to collections. And it could be because they messed up to begin with. Um, so you have any colleagues in North Carolina? Um, <laughs> I, I do know some folks. I will, I will tell you if you, if, if you have people that are talking to you about those type of issues, there's a great resource. It's the National Association of Consumer Advocates. Okay. Um, it's, it's a group of attorneys throughout the country. Um, they, you can sort by state, um, and they are pretty good about vetting members. It's not just anybody wants to join, can join NACA. It's uh, pretty select. Uh, you know, you've got to go through approval process. You've got to say, I don't represent any creditors. Um, and most of those folks are pretty geared toward helping consumers, uh, even if it's something that's just literally helping consumers and it can't really help them in their practice or anything like that. But uh, if a debt collector is sending those things and they're checking boxes and disputing it and they're not complying with Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, that is a big problem. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh.
Any more questions? Sure. So the, the question is, why aren't the American... The, the question is, why are there only about four or five major health insurance companies, and wouldn't it be better if there was competition amongst them and there were 100 instead of four or five? Um, and somebody in the audience said lobbyist, um, and that's probably a good answer. Uh, and I think your point is well taken, though. I do think that probably if you had 100 uh, health insurance companies that um, apparently Siri doesn't understand me, which is not a big surprise. Uh, but if you had more companies out there and there was more competition, you would, uh, you know, whether it would be on the on the consumer side or whether it would be on the physician side, that you know, the benefit would really be seen. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm sure the rates would be lower, but... Uh, at the same time, I mean, all that competition is, you know, th they're going to be trying to cut their rates somewhere and they're going to, uh, you know, th something's got to give somewhere. And, 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 you know, some of them may be better for physicians, some may be better for consumers. And, um, yeah, but my family, I have physicians, you know, they're physicians in Taiwan. They went to the largest benefit. I So, and so the, the comment is that you know while the rates that physicians may get reimbursed if there was more competition uh, might be less, the, the whole process might be a whole lot simpler. You would need less employees to do the billing. And so while the money you got in from the insurance company would be instead of $1.50, a dollar, you no longer need ten people to get the dollar fifty. So, uh, and that's a that's a good point. And and look, I mean, I I run a small business too. I get it. I mean, if I if I had to worry about you know running down clients that bad um, that to to get paid every month, you know, I, I mean, I I'd have to hire somebody. I, fortunately, I don't have that issue. The way my practice is set up, it's not a uh, where I'm billing like that. Um, so yeah, that's my benefit. But if I was, and I know there are law firms that have people that just do that, that just do send out the bills and run down whether or not they get paid. If if I had to do that, or my paralegal had to do that, I don't know we would. I don't know where we find time to do that because we're really good at practicing law. We're not good at that stuff. But uh, I think we are bumping up on the time mark. We've got probably time for one more question or in depth comment if anybody has one or. Um, Otherwise, I, I, I'm free to answer questions if y'all have a question that you want to ask. Um, but I, I think we've we've pretty well covered this topic. Well, thank y'all.